morning, everyone. So glad you're all here today. I'm sorry, I get to singing and then, whew, I need something to drink. So on April 21st in 1997, there was a man, his name Alec Holden of Great Britain, and he had turned 90 years old. On that day, he placed an equivalent of a $200 bet in British, British pounds that he would live to be 100. A betting company had placed Holden's odds at 250 to 1. So, 10 years later, on April 24, 2007, when he had turned 100, he collected on his bet an equivalent of $50,000 in British pounds. So, Holden, who was a retired engineer, he credited, credited porridge, which, you know, if that's where you want to eat, when, fine, <laughs> porridge, and then playing chess as the keys to his longevity. He also confessed that in the days leading up to the big payoff, that he was very careful, right? And he frequently had to remind, us, remind himself just to keep breathing, right? Just keep breathing. It's almost there, you know? Um, this past week, I had my annual checkup, and everything was pretty good. Uh, the doctor said, you know, you, your LDL, your glucose, the numbers are a little off. He said, so maybe exercise a little bit more. So I'm looking for a new doctor, you know, get that second opinion, because, you know, really. But, you know, we were talking, and John and I were talking, it's like exercise, you know, when you're doing something, you're doing a sport, it's, you know, it's nice, you know, you're doing something, but just to get out and just to walk, you know, or just to exercise for the sake of exercise, it's hard, right? But, I mean, what was interesting, though, about my checkup is the nurse came in, and she asked me this question, and the doctor came in, and he asked me the same question, and it was, how has your mental health been? She asked me, have you felt any kind of hopelessness in the last couple of weeks? And the doctor had told me, you know, that with everything going on with the, in the last year and a half, that is just really taking its toll on people. So they asked this question as they're coming in. They want to make sure people's mental health are in check as well. But, you know, I don't have to tell you this, right? You have probably seen it. You have probably felt it. And even though you have probably heard a similar message over and over again, that something, there's a good chance that something has happened just in the past few days or the past couple of weeks that was discouraging or that was heartbreaking. You know, friendships falling apart. Maybe family members have passed away. We have this us versus them mentality that has split us in two, right? You, you got to be checked. You got to take one side or the other. You're a Democrat or Republican, liberal, conservative. You're a mask, not mask, you're unvaccinated, you're vaccinated, you're Star Wars or Star Trek. There is something you have to take a side to, right? You can't just be one or the other. You can't go out and, and watch all the Star Wars movies and say, oh, yeah, I'll watch Next Generation on Sundays too. No, no, you can't do that. But, but you, you know, they, they say, you know, that the middle ground is for the weak. You know, you're just undecided, right? And so there's this division that we have here. And every week, it seems like there's something that just comes in week after week. Anybody remember murder hornets? I mean, what happened to them, right? They just kind of vanished in thin air. And then a couple of weeks ago, I was reading an article about the mosquitoes with the EEE virus. I've never even heard of that before. And now they've got articles for that. And now the cargo ships, now they're sitting offshore. There's always something to get concerned or something to get worried about, it seems. And sometimes life just gets hard and difficult. And just like the man we were just talking about earlier, Alec Holden, sometimes you just have to remind yourself, let's just keep breathing. Just the basics. Just to keep going. Just pushing through life. So what do we do during those times? What do we do to defeat the kind of discouragement that sometimes takes your breath away? What do we do to keep on going when we feel like quitting? I have felt this. I have cried out to God many times and said, God, I just don't know if I can take this anymore, the weight of this, the weight of what's going on in my life. Lord, where are you? I don't feel you right now. And for some of you, that might make you a little bit nervous to talk to God that way. You know, maybe it might seem a little disrespectful, but, you know, I encourage you, go read the Psalms. Go see the crying out. Go read it, the discouragement, the heartache that you say. And then you can see, though, 
throughout Scripture, God is there to take care of your needs because he cares and he loves you. So today we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10 where we have the core, the summary paragraph of this book. The author is writing to these Jewish Christians who have come upon hard times and are considering bailing out of their Christian commitment to return to Judaism. So this book was written to discourage believers, to people who are tempted to give up on Christ, give up on their faith because of the hardships that they are experiencing. The author of Hebrews is essentially telling them, look, Jesus is worth the trouble. He's worth the trouble that you're going through. And to do this, throughout the book of Hebrews, the author is very dependent on the Old Testament. And he has a lot to say about how Jesus is superior to the Old Testament sacrificial system. And this morning we're going to see that the book of Hebrews offers the same encouragement. The same encouragement today to anybody who's thinking and throwing in the towel. So turn to your Bibles or pull up your favorite Bible app. And go to Hebrews, we're going to be in chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 19. Um, I will be leading, uh, leading, I'll be reading from the ESV translation this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. And I'd like to welcome our people online watching. We're so glad you're with us today as well. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse, start in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Somebody might be thinking, what in the world did I just read? <laughs> what is going on, right? The holy places, curtains, are these those thick grandma curtains with all the flowers? What is happening here, you know? Through the flesh? So I believe a little background is going to help us out here this morning. So in the Old Testament... Only one man, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, could enter in the presence of God. And that man was the high priest. And on that day, he met with God behind this thick curtain. A lot of translations will say veil. Super thick. And then he would go into the Holy of Holies, beyond which nobody else could go. And the high priest was to perform rituals to atone the sins of the people. You can see um, this in Leviticus 16. So before entering the tabernacle, the priest was to bathe and put on special garments. Then sacrifice a bull sin offering for himself and his family. The blood of the bull was to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. Now you're going to catch some of these words as we're going through Hebrews here. And then he was to bring two goats. One to be sacrificed in this blood sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. And the other goat was used as a scapegoat. And this is where we get our term scapegoat. He placed his hands on the head of the scapegoat. He confessed over the rebellion and the wickedness of the Israelites. And he sent the goat out with an appointed man who released it into the wilderness. The goat carried on itself all the sins of the people, which were forgiven for another year. So the removal of sin by the second goat was this living parable of the promise that God would remove our transgressions from as far as the east as to the west and that he would remember them no more. So the problem, though, is that the blood of the bulls and the goats could only atone for the sin of the ritual if it was continually done year after year. However, Jesus Christ's sacrifice was sufficient for all the sins of all who would ever believe in him. When his sacrifice was made, he declared in John 19.30, he said, It is finished. And then he sat down at the right hand of God because no other, further, uh, no further sacrifice was ever needed. So remember, there was this curtain and there was this veil, and they closed off the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest was allowed to go in there. So let's read that again, knowing what the author is referring to. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, so when we read the account of Jesus' death in Matthew and Mark and Luke, they all state that the curtain or veil of the temple was torn in two. Jesus shed his blood once and for all, providing eternal fellowship with the Father through all who put their trust in him. And his broken body and shed blood opened a way for us at any time to be in the very presence of God, the God of the universe, to be in his presence. So if you want to defeat discouragement, the first thing 
You need to remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Recall to your mind what he has done. Recall to your mind who he is. Remember, first of all, that Jesus opened up a way for you to God. He tore the veil. He tore the curtain. He made it possible for you to enjoy the very presence of your heavenly father. William Frey is a retired Episcopal bishop from Colorado. He talks about a time when he volunteered to read to a college student named John who was blind. One day Frey asked him, how did you lose your sight? He says, well, it was from a chemical explosion at the age of 13. How did that make you feel, Frey asked him. He said, well, I felt like life was over, John responded. He felt, I felt hopeless. I hated God. For the first six months, I did nothing to improve my lot in life. I would eat all my meals all alone in my room. One day, my father entered into my room, and he said, John, winter is coming, and the storm windows need to be put up, and that is your job. I want to see these hung up by the time I get back this evening or else. And then he turned and walked out of the room, and he slammed the door. And John says, I got so angry. I thought, who does he think I am? I am blind. So I got so angry. I did it out of spite. I just decided to do it. I felt my way through the garage. I found the windows. I located the necessary tools. I found the ladder. All the while muttering under my breath, I'll show them. I'll fall. And then they're going to have a blind and a paralyzed son. Right? So John continued, I got the windows up. However, I found out later that never at any moment was my father more than four or five feet away from my side. As a believer in Christ, you are in your heavenly father's presence at all times, even when he feels like it's far away. And that's what Jesus did for you. So when you get discouraged, remember that Jesus provided direct access to God through a new and a better way. So now if we look at uh, verse 21, we will see the second thing to remember. Verse 21. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, so the second thing to remember is that Jesus is your great high priest. He is better he is a better high priest than any other priest or minister. So what does that mean for us? So if you were to go back and look at uh, Hebrews chapters 1 through 7, that's what those chapters are all about. It's Jesus, God himself, who became one of us to suffer with us. He sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins, and now he lives to intercede and to pray for us all the time. And so that's what a priest does. He makes sacrifices and he prays. And Jesus is the great. He is the best high priest. When somebody says to you, I'm praying for you, how does that make you feel? Right? You get encouraged. I know that I can feel the prayers. When I know when somebody says, yeah, I've been praying for you this week, I was like, wow, you know, it's almost like I can feel that. It's such an encouragement. The good news is that Jesus is praying for us right now. Don't forget it. When you feel like quitting, you remember Jesus Remember what he has done. Remember who he is. Remember that he gave you access to God. He gave you access to God. And he is praying for you right now as your great high priest. And so since this is true, verse 22 says this. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Remember the rituals we talked about, the washing, the sprinkling of blood. The author is referencing these things. He's making this comparison. So if you want to defeat discouragement, remember Jesus and pray in faith. Pray in faith. Approach God's presence with full confidence. Come to the throne of grace, the throne of favor and blessing and kindness. God, uh, the grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. It is his benevolence to the undeserving. So we go to the throne of grace with the assurance that God will take care of your every need. Prayer. Come to God. It's the best thing to do when you see trouble ahead or if you're in the middle of trouble. When things get rough, when you are discouraged, then come into the God's presence and pray. 
Come into his presence. Lean into him. Do it, as the text says, with full assurance or confidence or certainty of faith. When you pray, do it with the assurance that God will hear and answer your prayer in a way far beyond that you can imagine. He might not answer your prayer the way you want him to answer it, but you have to have that assurance that he, is going to, he knows you better than you know yourself. You might be asking them for something like, yeah, you know, do you really want that? I mean, have you ever had your kids ask you for something just absolutely crazy? And you're like, no, I don't think that's probably a good idea. You know, I mean, so we have to believe, we have to believe that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Okay? So it's your faith in Christ that keeps you going. Your trust in him. So let's go to God with full assurance of faith. Pray in faith because you are forgiven. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, all your sins were washed away. We are made clean on the inside. God accepts us wholly. Therefore, we can come boldly and confidently to his throne of grace to find help in the time of need. Now, many of you have probably heard the story of Jim Elliott, but just in case you haven't, Jim Elliott and his missionaries. In 1956, Nate Saint, Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, and three other missionaries were killed by the Wadani people in Ecuador. And several years later, the families of the slain missionaries returned to those same people to share the good news of forgiveness in Christ. Nate's sister, Rachel, spoke to the man who killed her brother. His name is Minkai, and this is what she wrote in her journal about that encounter. She says, tonight when I was sleeping in the hammock, I heard a noise. Somebody was walking around in the dark. Minkai called out to her and squatted by her fire, wanting to talk. He said, you said that Wainani, the creator, is very strong. Rachel said, Minkai, he is very strong. He made everything here, even the dirt. Minkai said, you said that he could clean somebody's heart. My heart being very, very dark. Can he clean even my heart? Rachel said, being very strong, he can clean your heart. She wrote that Micaiah got up and walked away, but that the next morning he came back excited. He said, Star, what you told me is true. Speaking to God, he has cleaned my heart. And now it's clear like the sky when it has no clouds in it. See, just over a year ago, on April 29th, 2020, Steve Saint, who is the son of Nate Saint, who was the one murdered, one of those murdered missionaries, he posted a video about Minkai's recent death. I think we have a picture of these two. He had this to say. He says, a kind, gentle, fun-loving man has just died deep in the Amazon jungles of Ecuador. His name known to millions of people around the world as simply Minkai. He was one of my dearest friends in the world. Minkai and a small group of people from his violent tribe speared my father Nate to death when I was just five. Only those who understand the transforming power of Christ's message could understand our friendship. We will miss you for a while, Grandfather Minkai, but we look forward to the reunion we have with you that we are promised. Isn't that amazing? The forgiveness that he had in his heart. It's amazing. So no matter what you've done, no matter what you have done, I'll say it one more time, no matter what you have done, God can clean your heart. He can make it clear like the sky when it has no clouds in it. All you need to do is confess your sin to him. Trust Christ with your life. Trust him who died on for your sins on the cross and he rose again. And for those of you who have already trusted Christ with your life, please realize that you are already clean. Please understand that God has already washed your heart clean. So you are not afraid to come to him when you have times of need, when you want to just cry out to God. I promise he can take it, right? He can take it when you just have that assurance to just come to him. So if you want to defeat discouragement, remember Jesus and pray in faith because you are forgiven. Furthermore, remember Jesus and persevere with hope because God is faithful. 
You hang in there. You don't give up on your hope because God is always, he always keeps his promise. Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God will never go back in his word. You can trust him to keep his promises no matter what. So don't give up and don't lose your hope because God will come through every single time. In his book, The Jesus Creed, Scott McKnight shares this moving story about Margaret Alt. When Margaret was just about to complete her PhD at Duke, something unexpected but quite welcome happened, and she fell in love. She went on a date with a man, now I'm going to probably butcher this, Hyungu Kim, that oh, wasn't too bad, Hyungu Kim, and then the proverbial sparks, they flew, but almost as quickly as the sparks became fire, they were doused with water, as Hyungu informed Margaret that he was HIV positive. So needless to say, Margaret was devastated. In her own words, she said, I had just met someone I liked, and we were definitely not going to live happily ever after. I felt like I had been kicked in the gut by the biggest boot in the world. But still, she and Hyungu, they were married. And his book, McKnight, asked the question many of us would ask. She said, why would anyone invite into the core of their being so much pain? He then goes on to share the answer unfolds in the rest of the story. He writes, when Margaret was a graduate in graduate school at Duke, they loved to walk in the Duke Garden. So... And so knowledgeable did they become of its plants that they supervised uh, construction of a new project. They walked through each part of the garden, routine, garden routinely, and they even had names for some of the ducks. So in their last spring together, the garden seemed especially beautiful, but beautiful to them. He died in the fall, and Margaret returned to the gardens in the spring where the memorial garden of roses was being constructed in his honor. So in her book, Margaret reflects on the day she returned to the gardens, she writes this. She says, where peonies were promised, there were only the dead stumps of last year's stalks. Where daylilies were promised, there were unprepossessing tufts of foliage. Where houses were promised, there was nothing at all. And yet I know what lushness lay below the surface. Those beds were so brown and empty and to the unknowing eye, so unpromising but they would be full to bursting in a matter of months. And then she asks, is the whole world like this? Is this what it may, might be like to live in that expectation, the real expectation of the resurrection? Was not Hyungu and my life together like this, empty and withered, and yet a seedbed of fullness and life for both of us? He died and I was widowed, yet in his dying we were both made alive. Margaret found hope in the midst of her pain because she refused to focus, focus on the deadness around her. Instead, she focused on the promise of life. You see, God's promises are like seeds planted in a brown and empty world. What seems so barren will one day be bursting with life and beauty and joy. So please don't give up on God in the midst of your pain. If you want to defeat discouragement, remember Jesus and pray in faith because you're forgiven Remember Jesus and persevere with hope because God is faithful. And finally, remember Jesus and provoke one another to love because Jesus will return. That is our hope. So as the days of Jesus' uh, Jesus's return gets closer, the Christian life will become more and more difficult. So we need to be there for each other. We need to encourage each other in love and the good works. Look at verse 24. He says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Just a couple of weeks, a little over a week ago on October 9th, one of the most heartbreaking games, football games, was ever played in College Station, Texas as Texas A&M took down the then-ranked number one Alabama in the last two seconds of the game with a field goal. Might not have been heartbreaking to most of you in here because I know everybody was like, we can't wait to see Alabama lose, but it was a little bit heartbreaking. 
But what was really most impressive about that game to me is that it happened in front of 106,815 fans. The second largest crowd in Kyle Field history just over a week ago. Tom, we were um, praying this morning. What did you say, Thomas, that really, it really struck a chord when we were talking about gathering together? What did you say? you don't show up, nothing's going to happen. But the potential is unlimited for what can happen if you do. Now, here's the deal. Honestly, if you're sick, please stay home. Nobody wants a stomach bug. Those are the worst, right? Oh, my goodness. You know, nobody, a head cold, flu. We don't want any of that, right? Stay home. And look, I think the most people understand that you have, you know, you might be compromised, immune compromised, or you're taking care of someone, and we all get that, right? However, gathering together with other Christians, other followers of Christ is a conscious decision, right? I know Pastor Matt posts a lot of, you'll see him say, you know, a Sunday morning decision to go to church starts on Saturday, right? You decide Saturday you're going to come on Sunday. And I know sometimes it's a sacrifice. Sometimes it's budgeting a drive through meal on Wednesday. I do that, right? It's like we've got to have a drive through meal. That's the only way we're going to get here on Wednesday nights, you know, because we've got this coming here. We've got some for the kids. The youth group is meeting over there on Wednesday nights. You know, so sometimes you just got to make that sacrifice. You might get an eye roll from your teenager or an eye roll probably from your spouse who just wants that one morning to sleep in. He's like, you're kidding me? You know, I'm going to get up every morning. I can't have one morning to sleep in. You know what? After church, go home, fill up on fried chicken, go take a nap. You'll be fine. That's what I do. Fried chicken at Lowe's. If you've never had Lowe's fried chicken, oh, my goodness. They got everything, fried chicken, mashed potatoes. Um, it was, it's like our thing, fried chicken on Sunday. So maybe it's a southern thing. I don't know. But, you know, I mean, the point is that we need to get together, right? We need to encourage one another to love and good works. See, I believe that the church, Potter's Hand, and all these other, these great churches in Apex and in Wake County, I believe we can become a church full of regular people coming together to do extraordinary things for the glory of God. Not for our glory, not for my glory, but for the glory of God. Regular people coming together to spur one another on for God's glory and His kingdom. A church full of people who share their shortcomings, who share their dreams together. A church with people who sometimes they feel like quitting, but together they find a replacement. Find a way to replace this effort, and they replace it with joy. They replace it with the joy of God, the Holy Spirit's joy. And then they take on the world, and they tell other people about this joy. They share. They share what God has done in their life with other people. You know, one of the, you know, I think we were talking about this the last couple of Wednesday nights, about sharing um, God with other people. And one of the best things that you can do, you might not have all the answers, but one of the best things you can do is share your testimony, is to share, this is how I was. This is how I was, but this is how who I am now, because I am new. Because God came into my life, he took all the junk, he put it back together, and praise God, praise God, I am a new creation. Your testimony is powerful. It is powerful. You are not meant to do this alone. And as an introvert, I can tell you, boy, it's really easy to feel like you could do this alone, right? Just sit, I just sit in my house and I'll just read the Bible by myself. You know, it can be. But I tell you, sitting around, the, even this morning, we had a circle, you know, we, we got done, they got, the band got done with rehearsal, we were sitting around together and we were just hanging out and just laughing and it was just, oh, it was just, uh, we weren't even talking about anything. We definitely weren't talking about anything serious. I mean, get these guys together, man, it's, it's hilarious. And we just laugh until I'm crying. 
But, I mean, it's just getting together and being with like-minded people and Christ followers, people who will encourage you and just lift up your spirit. And you can just feel the Holy Spirit moving through that. You know, I don't get it. Some of you might be uncomfortable with an enclosed space, but while we have this nice weather, you know, go find a park. Go find a Bible study. Go outside, you know. If you don't want to come when everybody else is here, We've got other nights. We've got rooms back here. You can have a small group in. Let's talk. Let's get creative, right? Don't, don't think, well, you know, I just I, it's not the way it used to be, so I'm just not going to do it. God really gave us a creative mind. Let's really think about how we can do this. So if you want to defeat discouragement, you remember Jesus. You remember what he did for you. And you pray in faith because you are forgiven. Remember Jesus and persevere with hope because God is faithful. And finally, remember Jesus and provoke one another to love as the days get closer to Christ's return because it's not going to get easier. So we want to come together. So let's all stand. And for the next few moments, I'm going to give you time to respond to anything that God has put on your heart this morning. You can worship with this last song. You can kneel or bow at your seat. Just or bow your head. Or the altar will be open for anyone who would like to come up and pray. But for these next few moments, we're going to take some time to lean into God. To lean into Him. And we're just going to take out all the distractions of this week this morning we are going to focus on our heavenly father we're going to give him these next few moments and we're not just going to talk it's a conversation right we're going to listen to what he has to say to us we're going to pray and we're going to thank him for his goodness we're going to pray for his wisdom so cry out to your heavenly father this morning who loves for you who cares for you. So let us worship and we're going to pray together. Just take a few moments.